Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 61 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on the kitchen of a cottage by the sea with walls made mostly of glass, so that the room is filled with the weather and the day and the night as they make their exchange. The light of early morning and the sound of the sea breaking on the shore washes over the empty room. There are four women living in this cottage, the mother, Shirley, her partner, Sarah, and two of Shirley's daughters, Georgia, or George, and Tony, who expect their sister, Robin, to arrive shortly with her boyfriend, Mark. But Mark appears unexpectedly early without Robin, saying that she has gone missing and hasn't been heard from for a week. Apparently, this is not unusual, because Robin has always been troubled and taken off without notice. Mark seeks refuge with the family and waits helplessly for Robin to arrive. But Robin doesn't come, and Mark and the women must learn to live with her absence. This is the atmospheric opening of Cordelia Lynn's new play, Sea Creatures, which as we record this episode is playing at the Hampstead Theatre in London in a spellbinding production directed by James MacDonald. The play is a poetic exploration of loss and grief, its setting betwixt the sea and the shore, rich in metaphoric resonances. I have admired Cordelia Lynn's work since seeing her play One for Sorrow at the Royal Court in 2018 also beautifully directed by James MacDonald. In One for Sorrow, an unspecified terrorist incident has led to widespread anarchy and threat in the city, and we watch a middle-class family react to the breakdown of order in their world. The play was both funny and bleakly provocative, challenging liberal assumptions about social empathy and race. Cordelia followed that play with love and other acts of violence at the Donmar in 2021, which questioned how successive generations might personally inherit the effects of historical cultural trauma, such as war or genocide. She has also written adaptations of Chekhov and Ibsen, her version of Chekhov's Three Sisters played at the Almeida in 2019, and her variation on Hedda Gabler, Hedda Tesman, was produced in Chichester the same year. I'm thrilled today to have the chance to meet and talk with Cordelia about her fascinating new play. Welcome, Cordelia. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me. Lovely to be here. Thank you. You wrote a couple of years ago that a play tells me how it wants to be written. (laughs) And until it does, I don't start writing. You could call this the voice of the play if you wanted. And each play has a different voice. So I wondered, where did the voice of sea creatures come from? And how did it tell you it wanted to be written? (laughs) Um, that does sound like the sort of thing I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true as well, though. It is true. I guess I'm trying to distinguish between sort of having the initial idea for a play and maybe when I feel ready to write it. And there can be quite a lot of time between those two moments. And that was definitely the case with Sea Creatures, where it sort of occurred to me as an idea in about 2013 or 2014, maybe. And um I had this sense of a family of women by the sea and a a very powerful absence and this guy who turns up and doesn't sort of fit into their world. But I didn't really know what it was doing or what it sounded like or why. And I just sort of just left it. I just leave them and let them bubble up every now and again. And they come back and then they go away again. And maybe I write a different play and I might learn something about other plays that I haven't written yet by writing something else. And um I actually hadn't thought about it for quite a long time. And when One for Sorrow that you mentioned earlier was on at the Royal Court in 2018 at the Royal Court upstairs, during that production, sea creatures suddenly came on really, really strongly, quite unexpectedly. And I was supposed to be going, I was going to an amazing residency in the States called McDowell. And I'd set myself up to work on Love and Other Acts of Violence. And then sea creatures just sort of flooded into my brain and um, I really had to write it and I started working on it and it just felt a lot clearer to me at that point and it was the play that I really needed to write and I wrote it out of commission no one had commissioned it I just went to this 
place and sat in a beautiful hut in a beautiful wood and, and wrote it. Oh, I love the sense that there's something just comes to you and, and then provokes you and prompts you and won't let you go. And mm. I wondered, was it the setting, the start? Because the setting is such a powerful part of the play. It's almost a character in itself. Mm. And uh, I wondered why you chose to set the play by the sea. You talked about the image of the family living by the sea. What is it about living by the sea that that came to you? It's difficult to describe. That's simply where the play had to be set. That came very immediately. What you say about the landscape being really important, that is important to me and that is important in this play. And I also write libretti, I work in opera, and there's an opera I've written where the fact that it's set in a wood in a forest is extremely important and that that forest, in fact, as a character, as a chorus, feels very alive. In sea creatures, it's the sea and it, you hear it and it's so beautifully constructed as a design in this particular production that you can almost smell it. Yeah. But it also, um, it also operates as a kind of metaphor in the play. It's about what is on the surface and what lies beneath and how we manage those things in our lives. Yeah. You talk about almost being able to smell it. You're always so conscious how close the sea is when you're sitting in the theater because there's sounds as well. In fact, my daughter took a photo of the set before the show began. And when we looked at it afterwards, we were surprised at how blue the light was, like we were actually underwater. Yeah. So you have the sound and power of the sea and the weather as well, because it's so close to the sea. There's a wonderful storm partway through the play, which just washes over the room. Yeah. And you also felt, I thought, Cordelia, like they were living somewhere slightly off grid. It felt a bit isolated and they were self-sufficient and not in much contact with the outside world, which I also love. So it's in a way we just disappear into that world for the extent of the time we're there. Yes. I was very determined not to set it on a particular coast. That was really important to me that I didn't say this is, you know, in the Hebrides or this is in Cornwall or this is in, you know, Kent or whatever. I wanted it to float and, yeah, to almost feel like they are floating on the sea, that they are kind of cut off. Yeah. And of course, you talked about the metaphoric resonances, and which we'll come to because the play includes stories about the sea that the characters tell, for example. Before we dive into the detail of the play, I wonder if you could give us a brief introduction to the characters and the outline of what happens when you bring this family together. So, I mean, you described it extremely well just now. I don't know how much I've got to add to it, but, you know, there is this family of women and it's quite important that they're women. There's Shirley, who's the mother, and she's a once celebrated academic, but now that hasn't published for a very long time for quite specific reasons and is sort of a bit forgotten. And her partner, Sarah, who is a painter. And Shirley has three daughters. It's suggested by from three different men um, from earlier in her life. Um, George, who's the eldest, who's heavily pregnant and not very happy about it. And the youngest daughter, Tony, who is strangely childlike, even though she's 22 years old. And then Robin, who is the middle daughter who is missing and who you are given a sense uh, struggled for a long time and suffers. And it's deliberately not made clear what that is, but it could be addiction or it could be mental illness or it could be trauma or it could be all sorts of things. But her suffering is sort of felt and it's related to this thing where she keeps vanishing. And um, these women have gone to the cottage by the sea for the summer, which belonged to Shirley's father and before him her grandfather and before him her great-great-grandfather, who were all fishermen. And they are waiting for Robin and Mark to join them for the summer. And Mark is Robin's boyfriend. And in the middle of the night, before they're supposed to arrive, Mark turns up alone in a state of distress. And he's looking for Robin as well. She's vanished again. And the play just goes from there. It doesn't really have a plot in the traditional sense of the word. They spend time together. The women allow him to stay in the house, which seems to be important. And they cook and they play games and they go for walks and they go swimming and they all deal with absence and loss. And from the central absence of Robin, which is the active one in the play, because they're waiting for her to arrive, it kind of spins out into all various sorts of losses that people might deal with in their lives from the past and in the present, whether that's death or suicide or your partner leaving you or in a very particular case 
Sarah seems to be losing Shirley to some kind of potentially dementia. And it becomes a play about how you how you live with loss, how you deal with it. You know, how do you survive with it? Yeah, that's beautifully done. Thank you. Thank you. You said it was important that it was all women in the house. And that was one of the things I was going to ask you to start with. Mm. It feels like initially we don't understand as you're sitting in the theater that they're all necessarily related. It is a family. And it feels like they're disparate women living an almost a commune-like existence by the sea here. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Shirley, his partner is Sarah, a woman. And there's no mention of the father of, of George's unborn child. Well, what they say is nobody knows, nobody cares. Exactly. So why did you choose? Is there some intent about how necessary men are or the, their destructive power or something? Why did you choose just women together? I sort of quite like things where there are lots of women hanging out. I enjoy the sound of women talking. <laughs> I know that sounds really <laughs> silly. And maybe it's sort of something that's sort of brought up in me as a girl where I you know, felt so aware that there were descriptions around women talking and women's bodies that were quite aggressive so like if you think about words like gossiping or bitching or squeaking or squalling or whatever and so I sort of always quite like putting a bunch of women talking together in places but in terms of how the play itself works there's a deliberate thing I wanted to do with genre and with upending our expectations of a particular kind of genre and this is a play which in some ways is an intruder play where there's a set community and someone comes into it and you know with those sorts of plays that this person who intrudes is going to change the community from a moral perspective and possibly destroy it. So you can think about plays like an inspector calls or like aristocrats, you know, there's going to be change. And often this intruder changes the community to such an extent that they're destroyed, but they perhaps leave with a wiser sense of themselves or life or whatever. And a very obvious way to do that would be, well, here's a community of women. And then are quite scary it feels at first bloke comes in and you sort of go oh, we know what's going to happen here or maybe you don't do that but that might be what I would assume if I saw that and the play deliberately does exactly the opposite yeah. and what actually happens is the women allow him to stay make space for him even though he's pretty tricky at first they recognize his distress and they allow him to be with them and through the course of the play, he learns from them how to live with and accept Robin's loss and can potentially begin a process of healing and moving on. So in that sense, it's a quite sweet play compared to my other stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I had just written one for Sorrow, which is a very, very bleak play where that happens, where things are destroyed. It's not quite as simple as that, but... I was feeling so bad about the state of the world when I wrote One for Sorrow, like really distressed and angry and Trump had just happened and Brexit had just happened and it felt like no one was able to talk to each other anymore and it was just dreadful. And I, I wrote One for Sorrow and then I, in a strange way, I sort of think I wrote Sea Creatures so suddenly it came to me as a almost a response, a political gesture sort of saying, but also we can be with each other and we can look after each other and I think Sarah says in the play it takes patience and a gentle hand and at the time of writing that felt very meaningful to me to do that. Fascinating because as I recall one for sorrow the thing is that they don't welcome the stranger into the house do they so this is the complete antithesis. Yes. And you're right it is touching to watch as it go through how Mark heals with the help of the women. Or learns to be able to you know, he's not quite there yet, but he's, he starts to learn to live and think in their way and accept it. And that might mean that he can heal. Yes. But there's an interchange as well. I think there's something they get from him too, mm -hmm. particularly with Tony, the young, youngest sister. So let's talk a little bit more about these lovely characters. Start with Shirley, the matriarch who's been a distinguished academic, but is not published, as you said, anything significant for a decade. And you also touched on the suggestions that she may be displaying possible signs of early dementia. She's only in her 50s, I think, which may be, I suppose, one of the reasons she hasn't published recently. And that is a particularly cruel irony, of course, that she makes her living and her identity comes from her intelligence. But of course, as we know, dementia is completely indiscriminate. 
Mm -hmm. But is this what's happening to Shirley? I mean, some of the other characters fear that this is what's going on. But I thought that was beautifully done in the sense that when you live with someone, and I'm sure there are very many, many people who have this experience, who may be displaying some of these signs, you become ultra sensitive to them and you start trying to decipher what this behavior might signify, if anything, whether it's beyond just aging normally or what is going on or some other source. So what are we to take, I think, about Shirley's condition? It's difficult. Yeah, I think it's Mark, typically, who says this could be early onset dementia. And that's a very Mark thing to say in the world of the play. And the, the girls, the daughters sort of laugh at him and tease him about it. And they say, well, you know, Shirley, she exists in liminal spaces. And what's happening with Shirley in the play is that she's falling out of time. So she's sort of experiencing and seeing things that happened many years ago. And, you know, the family have to sort of restore her sense of presence and say, no, that didn't happen just now. That happened in Ireland five years ago. And they talk a lot about bringing her back and enabling her to come back. And that's a very important theme in the play is whether you can get back to your home, obviously with Robin not coming back to her home. And this idea that Shirley might go all together, a place where Sarah can't follow her and they, they need to try bringing her back for as long as they can. And this is related to Selkie myths, which is a big thing in the play. But I wouldn't want to be so clear like Mark would be as to say, yes, she does have dementia. That's what's happening. It's possibly a bit stranger than that, but it's certainly a powerful thing for a family to be going through and to be observing. And for Mark as well, you know, one of the things I didn't mention, Shirley, who Mark admires her so much, he's writing his PhD on her. He's an academic as well. And she's like a god to him. And it's distressing for him to see that happening to her too. But the fact that she hasn't written for 10 years isn't to do with that, I would say. Okay. It's interesting you mentioned about her falling out of time. Because that's also potentially a symptom of dementia, of course. Yes. Where your long-term memory survives and your short-term doesn't. But on the other hand, you talked about Mark and his expectations of her, and he wants her to read his thesis yes. for his PhD on her work. And we feel throughout that potentially she's not even capable of doing this. But in fact, to counter the suggestion of dementia, there is a moment where she has read it, and she actually has a trenchant critical response. So she's not completely lost in that sense. No, not at all. Not at all. And I think even if it were decided that it were dementia and quite rooted in reality, it's quite early stages. You know, she's not like, oh, I put the chair in the fridge or something. You know, she has real clarity and real sharpness. Yeah. And she is highly intelligent. I mean, Tony, the youngest daughter, says something about her at one point. Shirley knows things too, but she pretends not to, so people will leave her alone. Ah, nice. You know, she's also just got a kind of wall around her so that she can keep moving through the world doing what she wants to do and thinking what she wants to think. But that's also a selfishness, isn't it? There's an air of detachment about her, which the rest of the family, to some degree, resent, I think, don't they? I mean, has she been, for example, a neglectful mother? Hmm. It's a good question. I'd say she were, I'd say she was a traumatized mother. Okay. You know, you can say neglect and on surface terms, you could say, yes, this is or is not neglectful. But she herself, as is described in the play in quite storytelling terms, has had a very traumatic childhood where she's had a grief stricken, incapable father and she's lost her mother. And one of the things the play looks at is how damage gets transferred in family generations. And I, I think it might be quite difficult for Shirley to be a mother. But we also had lots of lovely conversations in rehearsal where, you know, the actors would be quite kind of joy like saying, well, she's quite interesting. She probably gave them lots of good books and was quite fun in some ways. But then, you know, in other ways, she wasn't necessarily capable. And, you know, what do you do with trauma? Sometimes you can direct it into things. And I think she has this extraordinary mind and has directed it into her work and used her work also as a way of escaping her home environment when she was a young woman. Yes, because they talk about being left on their own, the children, while she went off to work with not a father around. So you could say that's neglect of a practical kind, at least. But it's interesting how she feels about how she's been a mother, I suppose. I don't think you get a lot of explicit insight into this, but I think she also carries some sense of loss or grief, certainly about Robin. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that's probably my opinion why she hasn't written for 10 years. Right. You know, they say Robin got smaller and smaller and then she vanished and then she was gone and Shirley never wrote again. The end. That's the story they tell. Yes, because the play opens with her dreaming of Robin trying to crawl out of the sea and her trying, but or not even trying to rescue her. Yeah, being afraid. Yeah, but she must carry some guilt about that as well. Yes. And maybe there's something in their relationship that is a source of the trauma for Robin as well as it was for her. Yep. As you say, the generations repeating themselves potentially. And speaking of the generations repeating themselves, there's George. And you mentioned that she's unhappy about being pregnant. Yeah, she's pretty unhappy about that. <laughs> well, it's complicated. It is. I want to ask you about this. She has this fierce disgruntlement with being pregnant. And it's a running source of black comedy in the play, I would say. But she's also deeply sad, clearly. And I wanted to know, why is she so unhappy, generally, and about this pregnancy? Well, I think we touched on it already, just when we were talking about Shirley. I think, I think she thinks, I'm going to get it right this time. You know, she says, I wanted to have a child because I needed to prove it was possible to be a mother. And this cycle of damage is going to end with me and my child. And then it's suggested in a very sort of playful, metaphorical way via a game of charades that her bloke has left her since she got pregnant. The end of the affair. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly that. Um, and so that must obviously be difficult. And I think she sort of has freaked out at some point and gone, no, it's not going to be any different. It isn't possible to be a mother. You know, my grandfather was damaged, Shirley was damaged, we're damaged, baby's going to be damaged. You know, Robin is gone and it will be like Robin again. And I can't, I can't live with that. And George is also the eldest. And she says quite clearly that, you know, she had to look after them a lot growing up. And so seeing Robin slipping through her fingers and not having been able, and of course, as a child, she shouldn't have had that expectation on her, but she would feel very strongly, oh God, it's you know going to go all wrong again. And I think that's what's happened. And her journey in the play, strangely, ultimately helped a bit by Mark, not Mark in the first half, where he's very aggressive with her about her behavior, but Mark in the second half, where he's learning more how these women live and how to be with them. She comes to accept the baby again gently yes but as you say mark is on her because she willfully smokes and drinks while she's pregnant but yes it's interesting you say as to why having said that she wants to prove it's possible to be a mother why she feels she's incapable of that but maybe that's just a natural reaction of course and it's interesting you say that she may have thought she failed robin as well i wanted to come back to sarah shirley's partner because we talked about shirley's detachment and I think that there's a, certainly a suggestion that Sarah's not happy with their relationship, with Shirley's detachment, perhaps from her. They no longer seem to share a bed. And I wondered what you thought about that relationship. Mm. Well, I think they don't share a bed because, in Tony's words, Shirley is a demanding sleeper. And you learn that Shirley has these terrible nightmares. And I think it can just be quite disruptive <laughs> to sleep with her. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? Yes. Sarah feels she's not getting the reciprocal emotional response or love, doesn't she? Yes. And um, I think that's the nature of being with someone like Shirley, who has their mind so in a different world. For her, it's the world of academia. But you could also say with artists, it can not, not always, it just depends on the character of the person, but it can often be like that. And, you know, you have to sign up to that, basically. And if you can't sign up to that, then they're probably not the right person to be with. But I think she admires and loves her very deeply. And she loves the girls very deeply. And she's come into their lives at a later stage. You know, we sort of felt maybe eight years ago or something like that. You know, none of this is made clear in the play. It's all to be discovered by the actors and agreed on in rehearsals, creating their version of what the play is. It is certainly the case that she hasn't been around forever. And she's turned up and just slotted into this family and started looking after them. And they've given her, in a way, a reason for being. And there are, there are reflections between her and Mark, potentially, that she clocks at the end when he stays in the house and the women all leave to go back home to the university. And she says to him, they'll keep you if you want, if that's what you want. And there's this idea that, you know, you can fit into this 
strange damaged family and find a way to exist with them. And maybe that will give your life some meaning as well. Well, she seems like a bit of a rock of stability in the family in some ways. And mm -hmm. and almost the reverse, as you're saying, of the cliche of the artist being the self-centered and mm -hmm. yeah. volatile character. Yes, because she's a painter. She goes to her little studio at the bottom of the garden and she paints and her painting is very important to her. Again, it's up to different productions to decide, but I imagine that she's actually quite a successful painter. And a very strange thing happens where Tony, the childlike daughter, becomes very frightened and in response to being very frightened off stage, destroys one of her paintings. And you would assume that the reaction to that would be, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm going to murder you. Like, how could you do this? It's the painting I've been working on for a month and da 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 and she just embraces her and says, never mind, never mind, oh, well, never mind. And it's very touching because Tony needs to be loved and cared for and rocked in that moment. And that's what Sarah does. She has the inner strength to do that, to perform that, I guess you could say maternal, but I would say generally parental role. But on the other hand, it's very sad because, you know, here's a woman who's an artist whose work has been destroyed and who prioritizes caring for this childlike adult, really. She is an adult, Tony over being really fucking pissed off about <laughs> being destroyed. So, you know, it's complicated, her relationship with the family and her relationship with her art and why she has made these choices to stay and be with them are quite dark and strange and interesting areas, I think. Well, in, in the performance as well, I thought she comes across as calm and wise mm -hmm. and considerate mm -hmm. and I think is the peacemaker as well, in a sense. They all talk, and she talks particularly about the detachment of Shirley. And there is a sadness in that because you feel like she deserves to get the reciprocal love. And I guess she does get it from the children. Yes. She talks about Shirley not being able to distinguish between things. She says she doesn't distinguish between me and anyone else, between me and anything else. And in fact, I think George also says that Shirley doesn't distinguish things. I mean, the word distinguish, I thought was interesting, which I guess means... It comes up a lot, yeah. She doesn't really notice me individually, mm -hmm. I suppose. You could read it that way. But also, she has this wonderful line. I, I couldn't resist quoting this, Cordelia. It's beautiful. It's important sometimes to distinguish between the real and the felt and the feared. Like That's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a great description of the variables or vicissitudes of our consciousness, I suppose. Yes. Let's talk about Robin, the middle sister. As you said, she's at the center of the play, in a way, without ever appearing. And I guess you started to explain this, but the simple question is, why do you choose to make a character so significant for her absence? Um, I think that is a way of making someone very significant. Like, if you sort of think that, in a way, this is a play about grieving, different kinds of grieving and about loss, different kinds of loss and how we learn to live with it um, and whether we can learn to live with it. I think anyone who's experienced a very profound loss, and again, you know, there are many forms of loss. There's, you know, my partner who I was wildly in love with broke up with me, or there's my baby died, or there's my father died, or there's, well, you know, there are so many ways you can lose someone, or my friend was in an accident and their character changed completely, or I lost them to addiction. You know, there's so much loss in people's lives. And I think that's something that we can identify with all of us. And I think for me, a clear way of making that clear <laughs> is to put a great gaping absence in the middle of a play, so much so that it becomes a form of presence. I think people who you lose are like ghosts. They're sort of, they are with you. And the play is very ghostly. There are lots of ghosts in it, memories and, and people who aren't there, people who are missing. It's amazing how powerfully, actually, now that you say that, that we imagine Robin, we definitely think about her and try and almost picture her. Yes. And of course, I think we spend time trying to decipher what's happened to her. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you saying that you deliberately are not specifying what has gone on. Yeah. I mean, there are obviously suggestions of troubled childhood. There are hints throughout the play, aren't there, about her running away previously about possibly been in hospital even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, we get this really terrible description from Mark about how she invites random men back to their flat for sex, one assumes, which betokens serious trauma. 
mm-hmm. and dangerous behavior. But all these hints, do we not think she's not going to come? She's gone now forever. What did you think? I pretty much thought she's not coming. She's gone now forever. Is that, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know either. I honestly don't mean to be annoying here. I, I would really like people to bring that themselves. That would be really important for me. I mean, they say at the end of the play, Mark finally receives what he needs from Shirley, who he's been following around, suggesting, I want her to comment on my PhD. And actually, she does do that ultimately. And she does it very quickly and very swiftly. And she casts it aside. And then actually, she gives him the lessons that he really, really needs. And they are to do with this living with loss thing. And um, he says, she's not going to come, is she? And then he says, she's not going to come to me again, is she? And Shirley says, no, I think not. And that's not to say that she will never, ever come again. But she's she's not going to come to Mark again. And she may well not come to her family again. I don't know. And even if she does, she may go away again, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. And people who are very damaged, you know, you can't you can't hold on to them with the best intentions in the world. You know, people who become very damaged, they do slip through your fingers, you know, even in very loving families. If no one's ever experienced that kind of person in their life before, they might be very judgmental about this family in a way that Mark is a bit judgmental about them. You know, why are they all sitting around drinking coffee and playing Jenga and telling stories in funny ways? You know, what what are they doing when they've got this young woman out there who's clearly a mess? But it's hard to hold on to people who are very damaged. Well, you can't control independent human beings. You can't be accountable or responsible for everything they do with their lives. I mean, one has to learn that as a parent with your children. That's the point. They are independent beings and they will do what they will do. Totally. And as a parent, it's actually, I mean, outside of the metaphorical world of the play, but in more mundane terms, after the age of 18, you have real responsibilities. You have legal responsibilities towards someone where you can sort of control what you do more and there are these suggestions that she's been in hospital and they've taken her to hospital and tried to look after her but once someone's an adult you know i mean off they go if they want to yeah let's talk now about the youngest sister tony speaking about being an adult as you said she's in her early 20s but behaves it seems like a child and seems to have very little understanding or experience of the real adult world or at least she does not appear to be participating in it in the normal sense, and may not even be capable of doing so. And I want to ask you, Mark refers to her conscious naivety. Mm. So I'm interested as to whether, how much is her arrested development deliberate, or is she really this innocent? Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's a really tricky thing, very tricky to play as well for an actor, because she's not pretending to be a child. She's not doing baby voices and pretending to be a child. She is arrested in a sense. And I would say that people become arrested when they are at moments of trauma as well. So I would say that at the point at which Robin starts getting very bad, something freezes in Tony. And that is, you know, not an uncommon response from siblings. But there are also reasons for being a child, which are that hopefully in the world. If you're a child, people are more likely to look after you, we hope, under the best possible circumstances. And again, hopefully under the best possible circumstances, if you're a child, people are less likely to hurt you or do you harm. And those seem to me in life like quite good reasons for being a child, (laughs) to be looked after and for people not to do harm for you. And, um, you know, Tony's very smart in a way, and she is emotionally actually very smart about others. And I think On some level, she's kind of clocked that. But I I wouldn't describe it as manipulative. It's not like, oh, I'm going to be like this and then everything will be my way. It's not that at all. I think she is arrested in many ways. But there are good reasons for that arrestment as such. It's a self-protection mechanism of sorts, I suppose. Yes. And comes, I guess, potentially from trauma and fear of taking a step out. Yes, it's a kind of armour. You know, everyone in the play has a kind of armor, a shell as such. Yes. But she doesn't play it. It isn't played. She isn't speaking in a childlike voice. In fact, some of her observations are really quite perceptive. Very, yes. 
She has an emotional intelligence. She realizes, for example, she says about her mother, Charlie, who walks on the beach at night, that she does that to keep the dreams away a little longer. Mm -hmm. She understands, therefore, the psychology of her mother in that sense. So yeah, it's a very complex portrait. Fascinating, beautifully played as well, I would say. Yeah. And George also, again, another line I can't resist quoting. I mean, it's Cordelia. George has a lovely description of Tony when she says she has a child's idea of justice. Neat, pure, catastrophic. That's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> well, it is the way children... I mean, they do, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight ahead. Yeah. You know, children are obviously easily frightened. I remember being little and being very easily frightened. I remember things that we might now a days assume are too dark for children. You know, Grimm's fairy tales and, you know, really tricky stuff like that actually kind of weren't too dark because you really got it. Because they had, as a child, they had very, very clear morals. Yes. You know, if you behave in this way, then this will happen to you. And if this person is bad, then this will happen to them. And it makes a tremendous amount of sense to children. And you haven't lost your clarity of right and wrong in a way, which, you know, obviously there's a way more complex scale there as you get older about like, well, what is right and what is wrong? And if you do something wrong for the right reasons or right for the wrong reason, you know, all of that kind of stuff, you know, when you're a kid, you know, the main thing that they say, real passion, that's not fair. Yeah. You know, it's like the end of the world for a child. Yes. Moral order is so important. Yeah, really, really important. And it's wonderful to witness because you sort of think, actually, it's endemic in us, isn't it? It's, you know, trailing these clouds of glory. We have some sense of what is right, maybe, but it's very black and white, as you said. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Mark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he arrives heartbroken, appears to be on the verge of a breakdown, in fact, with his anxiety and his loss. He's essentially demonstrating, is he not, features of grief, despair and anger and... Yeah, I'd say that. And he has probably been through some really difficult times with Robin. And he shows up and decides he's going to wait for Robin for whatever reasons of his own in this house with her family. And he begins to try and impose order, <laughs> which is his way of, you know, dealing with stuff. He starts taking things over and disrupting the carefully constructed rituals and behaviors of this family. He starts doing the cooking, for example. Yeah, he starts really doing the cooking <laughs> and the gardening and trying to get Tony to get dressed. You know, one thing we haven't mentioned about Tony is she never gets out of her pajamas. And for him, this is like really terrible. You have to, you know, get washed and dressed before dinner and that kind of thing. And he starts just doing things. And sometimes that's with very comic effect. And sometimes it's with quite scary effect. I wanted to ask you about the scary effect. So you talked earlier about the intruder genre this idea of the intruder and the potential threat, because there are several surprising occasions in the play when there's a sort of freeze frame moment where the characters repeat a couple of lines of a scene. Yeah. And the first version is characterized by a small act of violence, generally by Mark, at which point it stops and rewinds and they repeat the lines again, but this time it flows on normally without this sharp moment of violence by Mark. So this is not naturalistic. It's a surprising moment in the flow of the play. And I wondered, what are these moments about? Why did you treat them in this way? So I think the first time it happened, it happened quite instinctively. And in, in the script, you know, I don't know whether this is interesting to know or not, but in the script, those little moments are written in bold type. And then, as you say, you reverse a bit and repeat again, and it goes back to normal type. The first time it happened, I was writing and it happened instinctively. And I thought, oh, OK, what's that? And then I realized what it was. And I think what they are is they're sort of little moments of almost intrusive thoughts. You know, again, I've spoken before about what lies underneath the surface, which in this play is often damage and violence and fear and trauma and, you know, all these horrible things that are bubbling below the surface. And you get little insights into things that could happen and like you say, they are often around moments of violence, you know, Mark hurts someone or asks someone to hurt him in a very grand one at the end of the play. Well, grand is the wrong word, but he takes out his own heart and puts it on the table. And 
they're just little flickers of the dark, violent feelings that are underneath this, which I think, you know, we all have intrusive thoughts, but then the rest of life carries on around them. And you think, oh, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of stage or dramatic representation of that. That's brilliant because it also, I think, suggests and reveals suppressed emotion or rage in Mark. Mm -hmm. And I said about grief, anger may be part of it. I mean, Shirley describes him as the angry man and yes. and later as angry and sad. Well, she says maybe he's not angry, maybe he's sad, but he's young, so he doesn't know the difference. <laughs> yeah. It feels like throughout he's consciously working to keep a lid on his emotions. Yeah. To not break down, to not erupt. Yes. And that's partly about the cooking. And I wanted to ask you about this preoccupation in the play with the cooking, not just for Mark, but... Because there are these very specific, lovely, evocative descriptions of the preparation of food and the process of cooking. So uh, why did you include so much detail about, you know, recipes, the preparation of specific dishes or food? Yeah, there are lots of reasons behind that. Firstly, I sort of love actors cooking on stage because it's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard because it has to be extremely carefully choreographed. I just find it really fascinating to watch mundane things that we do every day without thinking about, like even just making toast, I think they become quite beautiful when you see them happening on stage. So just generally, I quite like that. But in terms of the theme behind it or the meaning behind it, food for me and how food is managed is a lot to do with nourishment and nurture. It's very important in family units and between friends and within societies and whether you are able to receive food or whether you reject food, I mean, even from the very point of birth is a quite significant thing and whether you are well or not, basically, and metaphorically or in psychoanalytic terms, you can expand it and say, can you receive nurture or not? And that's sort of very embedded in the psychoanalytics of the play and about, again, you know, we keep talking about trauma and damage, but it is the heart of the play. So the food and the preparation of food and the wish to make food and give people food and how that has to be quite splendidly managed by Mark is significant from that perspective as well. It gives you a role, doesn't it? That role of putting the food for others on the table is important. Yes. You feel needed in so doing, but you're also caring for others. Mm -hmm, totally. But he sort of takes over and starts, he's told Sarah cooks, except on Sundays when Shirley cooks, and then that's a rule in the family. It's a ritual. It can't be broken. And he says, well, now I'm cooking. And at first he cooks in this quite deranged way, like very skillfully, but there, it, there feels like there's a lot of violence behind the cooking and the preparation of food. And, you know, again, it's comic, it's sort of funny. And then later it becomes more relaxed. And they just talk about food a lot because, you know, if you don't want to talk about the absolutely terrible, horrifying thing, you could talk about the weather and you talk about what you're going to eat for lunch because you're not talking about the other things. And then the cooking of it is a measure of control, isn't it? Especially for him, so that... It helps him not to lose his grip. Yeah, totally. To go through the routines, the discipline of it. And he has another another wonderful phrase about how this roots him with his physical action. He walks everywhere. He washes his clothes by hand. He whisks mayonnaise the hard way by hand because he says, I do as much as is reasonable with my own body so that I can experience a realistic passage of time. I believe in a physical association with your actions in the world. That's beautifully put again. It feels like that roots us, you know, the connection between our mind and our body that roots us. Yeah. And there's a hint, you know, a very passing suggestion with Mark later in the play that he is perhaps not completely well either. He says about Robin, when we were at the hospital together, and it's just a passing line, but it sort of indicates that his life has not been entirely free from mental illness or damage either. And one of the ways he's found to bear that is with this continuous action and doing of things. Yes, I think we're very conscious of the fragility of his of his mental state. Certainly he's in that trauma of losing her that he needs to somehow deal with. There is another man in the play. Yeah. Fred the fisherman, who makes occasional visits to see the women. And he tells these fabulous, timeless stories of the sea. What is the purpose of the sea fables that Fred tells? Hmm. Well, so in the play outside of the family unit, and I didn't mention them in the summary, which is very remiss of me, there are two guests, visitors, outside of Mark, the you know original intruder. And 
the family tell a lot of stories, but these two tell stories as well. And they're sort of creatures in a way that come from the sea. One of them is very much a strange mythical figure, and we can talk about her in a bit if you like. But Fred is interesting because he's a bit more liminal. He's a bit more transitory. On one level, he's a fisherman called Fred, and his job is that he goes up and down the coast selling his fish to people. But when he comes, he tells stories, and you you know that he's known the girls since they were very little and they first ever came here after scary grandpa died and left Shirley the cottage. And he rocks up and sells some fish and tells a story and goes away again. And they've created a whole ritual around that moment. And I guess the purpose of the stories is like, you know, in a way, the purpose of any story that's told in the way that those stories are told is that they have morals in them. You know, they're quite fable-like, his stories. The language that is used is quite fable-like and they have darkness in them and you have lessons in them to be received. Yeah, they're almost supernatural at times. You're right, they're very metaphoric as well, with lessons of the sort about human life, like myths. But it's also like any story. It's a creative endeavor that helps us. It might even just be escape for a while. Mm -hmm, Totally. As well as educational. And you mentioned the other person who comes from the outside is the old woman. She walks into the house out of nowhere in the middle of the play, and she delivers this astounding, essentially a monologue, although Mark is the only one there in the kitchen, in which she describes herself emerging from the sea in search of her skin. Well, no, actually not emerging from the sea in search of her skin, but she's been searching for her skin for years. She once, many years ago, emerged from the sea. Okay, so she's... Well, the point of this is to ask you about the mythical source for this story, about what are known as selkies, I believe. Can you tell us what selkies are and what the old woman's fleeting appearance in the play is about then? Yeah, so a selkie is a mythological sea creature of the kind of like of the mermaid genre, so part human, part sea animal. And selkies, they're seals who can take human form. And the way they take human form is they come onto land and they slip off their skin. And they often do that to have relationships with human beings. And there are different versions of what can happen under those circumstances. But one thing that's known about selkies is if you take their skin, they can never get back to the sea. And they will spend their lives trying to get their skin back. If you burn their skin, they can never get back to the sea. So they'll never be able to get home, which is one of the themes in the play. And... Even if they spend their entire life on land and have a family and are human beings, and they're always described as being extremely beautiful, the moment they get their skin, they'll leave it all behind, they'll go straight back to the sea. That's what's calling to them. It's where they belong. It's where they're from. And the old woman tells Mark, she's searching for her skin. She turns up and says, have you seen my skin? And he's like, what the fuck? Um, (laughs) And uh, then she tells him this story about her life and how she was tricked and her skin was taken from her by a man. And she's been searching for it ever since. Yes. And she had children, but she's now caught. The man who seduced her has now died, and she's now caught between the land and sea, and sorrow is her element. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And her moral is, she says, no port for returning, you'll never know fair winds, which is just if you don't have a port to go back to, there will be no fair winds for your ship, essentially. Yes. It's an absolutely beautiful piece of writing for a start. A spellbinding performance by June Watson. Yeah, incredible. She's wonderful. Uh, and I, I have to say, there are so many reasons to go and see your show, Cordelia, but that performance in that moment, that delivery of that speech is worth the price on its own. And I wondered if I might prevail upon you to read a little bit of this beautiful speech for us. Yes, I can do that for you. With the massive caveat to any of your listeners that I'm not one of those writers who's also an actor. <laughs> so I'm going to recite it like a poem and not act it like an actor would. And I usually read it quite fast when I've had to read it before. So I hope that's OK, which is very different to how you perform it when you perform it on stage. So Mark has said, are you OK? I was. I was in the sea years and years ago when I was just a little thing rolled in the dark and the cool and up to the surface now just for the air and the foam, how it gets you or maybe a fish delicious and flicker in the swell. The foam's a horse, you know, a horse on the tide and the wind its driver, beware an angry driver, the horse whipped and beaten will dash its fury to dust on the rocks, best dive deep down where it's still now and cool in the swirling and dark. 
But if the drive is pleasant, you can play in the rolling and tumbling all the sunshine hours. Just note how it gets you and don't mistake anger for play, as any mammy will tell her calf. So happy as many with my sisters and brothers and the salt on our whiskers and our grandam the moon to rustle and murmur our lullaby and light. But a man sang to me from the rocks one night. They always say, beware a man singing, don't trust his voice as far as it can lull you. But lulled I was and wandered my way shorewards into his arms. He had arms, bronze from the sun kissed and lean from the hauling and harvest of bodies. And he had legs too, good legs to cling me with and big lips to kiss me with and big boots to kick me with. And he had a back, patterned the way they are a man's back. You can tell a man's anger from the look of his back. And look I did and thought I'd never seen anything so lovely in all my slippery sliding days. So flip flop onto the rocks. A big wave to aid me, he strokes me and strokes and sings as he strokes me, patient as night, all night, till he strokes my skin right off. Lay it did a puddle on the shore, oh so raw, the girl beneath, I thought it would end me, all that desire, fool mad in the face of it, all that flesh. Magical. And that's not all, it does go on, but thank you. It does go on. <laughs> I don't know how she knows where to breathe, I'm like, what do you breathe in that? It's just astounding, astounding performance. And I, I have to say, it reminded me, I don't know whether this makes sense to you, of Dylan Thomas, hmm. his poetic language. Oh, that's nice. It's vigorous and onomatopoeic, I thought, and mythical in quality in some way. Of course, it's, it's a mythical story, but absolutely beautiful. Thank you. So the old woman is ostensibly or potentially a sea creature. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask you about the title of the play. Is the suggestion that the characters in the play themselves inhabit the same natural or even, I guess, metaphoric habitat as the sea creatures in the myths or Fred's stories? Mm -hmm. Could be that. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, it's nice. I don't know. Is it perhaps in some evolutionary sense that we, we came from the sea? And mm -hmm. I think that's talked about at one point, actually, isn't it? Sort of vaguely. Yeah. Maybe the sea creatures are the characters. Yeah, maybe we're all sea creatures in the world of the play. I don't know. Well, there's certainly an association, isn't there, between Robin, that dream that surely has a Robin coming from the sea without legs. She talks about her not having legs. Yeah. So again, I guess might be a reference to the Selkies. And uh, I don't know, maybe, okay, metaphorically, I was wondering about that we're, as the old woman is caught between the land and the sea and sorrow our element that we live in between joy and grief and mm -hmm. yeah and as sarah says you have to learn to live with loss and then you talked about it being what's underneath i think mark asked the old woman why is there so much damage and she says that's just how it is under the surface i wondered also is there an i don't know is there an ecological message in some ways i mean there's a drowned village just up the shore and it surely talks about that the cottage one day will be submerged. And in fact, actually in the text, there's a stage direction, Cordelia, which says that the cottage actually is submerged. Yes, when she's talking about the future. If there is an ecological message, it's very light. I'm very happy for it to be there. There is a speech that Shirley gives where she talks about the sea has been rising and falling and rising and falling for millions of years, and it's going to rise now for some thousands of years more, by which point all of this will be under the sea, essentially. That's paraphrasing. And it's at that point that the stage direction, the kitchen becomes submerged in the sea and sea creatures inhabit where humans once were. And, you know, I think it's very hard to read that outside of climate change terms now and rising seawaters. But I wouldn't say that it was a climate change play. I think it's more that Shirley's thinking about maybe the huge expanses of time and perhaps human troubles, everything that these people are suffering in this moment and for their lives, quite small in geologic time quite passing <laughs> and as is the power of the sea yeah it will retain the land and over millennia human life is nothing in that context mm -hmm. which can be a quite comforting thought or a very terrifying one depending on who you are time rolls on so i wanted to talk to you about the ending of the play because it feels like in the last scene that we've reached the end of some dreamlike period and that characters and we are now going back to the real world. And in the text, you titled the last scene for the journey, which suggests that they are moving forward to something different. Is that right? Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, all the, the scenes all have titles um, and all of the titles are taken from lines in that scene. They're just little snapshots. I think the line in that scene is the last meringue for the journey. He's offering it to Fred in payment for a story. Take the meringue with you for your journey. But yes, it does have that feeling to it that maybe people will move forward, which, like I say, is pretty optimistic for me. I don't usually write with optimism. It's sad. It's very sad, but it's got that element to it, I'd say. Oh, I think it definitely does. It felt like there's almost a stasis has prevailed for the time that we've been watching them, partly because they're waiting for Robin, Mm -hmm. who maybe they are accepting won't come. Mm -hmm. George's pregnancy, of course, has to end as well. Yeah, she's very heavily pregnant. And so they're going back to the city and she will give birth. And there is the suggestion, I think you said earlier, that Mark may have found a place he can imagine a future in. You talked about him leaving his heart on the table which is part of one of the stories Fred the Fisherman tells. Yes. It echoes that. Is that a symbol of him learning to live with his sorrow, like the girl does in Fred's fable? Yes, maybe. And it's also, you know, it's just, this is how, this is how broken I am. And, And the heart is a piece of driftwood. And it's like, that's all that's left of my heart at this stage. That's where he's at. (laughs) So can he carry on without this or with this petrified heart? I hope so. Yeah, he seems to be able to. I think it is optimistic. And then it actually finishes with the voiceover again of Shirley at the beginning. But this time, when she's looking to see if Robin's in the sea. She finds her father, who you feel is the source in a way of all this damage. He's a bogey figure, creature for the family, grandpa, who, you know, is a ghost that we have to keep out. And she tells him to go away. Uh, and that they won't come back, or the people we've lost aren't going to come back. So essentially stop hanging around here, haunting everyone. Yes. And does that feel like she's reached some place where she can accept it as well? Because she talks about she wakes to a calm sea and the rising sun. Those are optimistic images, aren't they? Yeah, they are optimistic images. Yeah. Again, I hope so. I mean, obviously, as we've discussed before, she might also be on track to going completely mad. So it's possibly too late for her, but it might not be too late for anyone else. I'd never like to say it's too late for someone, actually. That's a horrible thing to say. But I would say that, yes, the play ends with gently hopeful imagery. The ambiguities and resonances in the play are what make it so rich. So nothing's definitive, but it's a lovely suggestion. Thank you. I think we've reached the end of our time and the end of the play. So all it remains for me to do is one of the regular features of our podcast is that I like to ask my guests if they could recommend a play that's a personal favorite. One that we might do on the podcast if we haven't already done it, or just something that you love. Yeah, I'm really glad he forewarned me because this is the most terrifying question. So it's good to think about it. Obviously, I have loads of favorite plays and I have lots of very different plays for very different reasons. But I thought today I'd mention Rory Malarkey's Pity that premiered at the Royal Court back in 2018. And I say that because I think it's a unique, special piece of work, particularly in the British theatre culture such a fine writer with sort of a poet sense of the word and so politically astute almost prophetic in what he writes when he writes it and I loved it and I love reading it as well I've read it many times since I'll go back to that I did see that production and I'm trying to remember there's some quite striking visual imagery I think was there a village fat or something or is yeah yeah lots of things happening Oh, you know, amongst many other qualities, he has an absurdist quality to him, which is quite unusual in writing, and I really like it. That's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cordelia, for your time today. It's been a lovely discussion, and congratulations, and thank you for your play. Thank you. Sea Creatures is running at the Hampstead Theatre in London until the 29th of April. If you can, go and see it. It is a magical, memorable experience. As the sun rises on the calm sea and the women return to normal life and Mark leaves his black heart lying on the table, have they learned to accept the losses and sorrows they have suffered and which we will all suffer? To move forward through simply focusing on the distraction or comfort of everyday actions or by giving ourselves up to the lull and mystery of stories, past and present, or to the rhythms of the sea, the land, and the weather. Thanks for listening. See you next time.
There are additional footnotes about this and every other play that we cover in the podcast available to our patrons. Patrons also enjoy exclusive access to the play review, bonus episodes in which I review current productions that I see in my regular theatre going. To become a patron, visit patreon.com backslash the play podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at the play pod and on Instagram at the play podcast. Thank you again for listening and for your support. See you next time. Thank you.